precious name of Jesus who died and rose again we pray and let the church say amen, amen. hallelujah now, if you see me come like this today simply mean you should be ready to be writing means there's just too much you don't even know what to leave out you may take your seat thank you Holy Spirit Hallelujah. God is good. And all the time. Okay. So we are going to do a little bit movement. You know. So I want the kids to just fill up in the front. Still have someone to look after them. The people at the back. Let's move forward. Still sitting behind. But you are at the back. So let's do that quickly. Let's allow the kids to move forward. To fill up the space. And they still have some guidance. So my sisters, yes, just move forward. You are still behind or rather still at the back. Uh -huh. So today we are going to take a step further in our study of who the Holy Spirit is. Hallelujah. Um, the goal of this series is to bring you to understanding that the Holy Spirit is not a power is not an influence yes he has power yes he has influence but is not the influence he has power he is not the power the holy spirit is a person or a personality and we have to come to to this point in our journey where Biblically speaking, we've come to understand that the Holy Spirit is a person. So I said, if the Holy Spirit is a person, then he should be found having uh, characteristics that are ascribed to a person that are also given to the Holy Spirit. He is not a person until we find him having the attributes of a personality. It is the attribute of a personality that validate the personality of the Holy Spirit. He's been known as a power because of how he moves. He's been known as an inspiration because of how he inspires us. But he's not an inspiration. He can inspire you, but he's not an inspiration. He can move in power, but he's not the power. Hallelujah. Yes, he can move you into wisdom, but he's not wisdom. The Holy Spirit has wisdom, but he's not the wisdom. Hallelujah. He has knowledge, but he's not the knowledge. So today we'll be taking a step further, looking at the, the characteristics that makes a personality. I said last time to say, when we say the Holy Spirit is a person or a personality, we are not trying to say he has legs, he has nose, he has feet, no. These are not properties of a personality. Legs, nose, ears, all these things are not properties of personality. These are properties of a body. Today, through this inter uh, uh, intelligence, they are able to create in a similitude a being that will look like a human being. Who will have ears, eyes, nose. But the fact that that being has all these things, it doesn't make that being a personality. So today you have robots that if they sit here, you may not even know that this is not a human being. They have made, they've improved. One thing that they have never discovered is how to make the real skin. This one. They, they can make so many things. This is why even when someone has a major operation that needs skin or flesh, they can only take it from other part of your body and put it where it's more needful. But they can't invent. They can't create another skin. They can take. They can take from your leg. They can take from your arm, and put it where it's very needful. Even if they take flesh, um, there are such operation where they want flesh to fill up the hole. They can take it from somewhere else, but they can't create it. So even though this is the reality, what makes you a person or a personality is not the fact that you have legs, you have feet, you can walk. Uh, you can uh, touch no these are not properties of a personality 
These are properties of a body. So, when we say is a person, don't start a, having this image of the Holy Spirit with a nose. The Holy Spirit with long beards. You know, because you see, we have a limited understanding as human. We can only relate to anything that we don't know by using what we know. And that's the trouble. Anything that we cannot relate by what, with what we know, we don't know it. No matter how you explain it. So there are things that I may try to explain to you that I was eating when I was young. And that is not maybe found here. But for you to understand what it, it is, I must try to use something that you know. I will say, it looks like. Now your trouble, your mind will be telling you that when I say it looks like, better way to explain this okay so we have something in Zambia um, I believe also I saw it I think in Zimbabwe we call it Nyemba okay what you call it in Zimbabwe same Nyemba okay my sister do you know Nyemba no okay so it's part of the teaching now how would you help her understand Nyemba what would you do listen to that word it's what similar to beans now she'll be walking around thinking nyemba is like so you are only using beans because that's what you think she knows and you are using what she knows to explain what she doesn't know am i making sense and this is the trouble we have when we say the holy spirit is a personality you have never seen a personality that doesn't have hands like your hands doesn't have legs like your legs so you are now begin to imagine him in that similitude so the same way we are saying, if we say Nyemba, she has no idea because I've not seen it yet. But for you to make her understand what Nyemba is, you must use something that she has seen. So we will say, Nyemba looks like beans. Then we say, it tastes not really like beans. Then she's even confused now. Because she can't even relate the taste now from there. So this is what I'm explaining to you. It is not easy to explain what I'm explaining. To say he's a person, but he doesn't have a nose like your nose. He doesn't have the legs like your legs but he can move, he can touch. He doesn't have the mouth like your mouth, but he can speak. We will see when they prayed and the Holy Ghost spoke. So the limitation here is, trying, is that we are trying to explain something that is beyond our reasoning to, uh, to the point that we all have understanding. And for us to have understanding, we must use what we understand. So I'm saying the Holy Spirit is not a power. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is not um, the anointing. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is not knowledge. Is not wisdom. Is not inspiration. Yes, He has all these things, but He is not them. He has them, but He Himself is not them. Hallelujah. I've got a finger, but I'm not. I've got a finger. I have it, but I'm not a finger. I've got eyes, but I'm not. not eyes. So this is the same way. So today we are going to look at now. So when we say is a personality, we are now looking at things that makes a personality a personality, which I must cancel these physical features. They don't make your personality. Okay. If they create a robot that looks like you, we will still believe that this robot is not human. It's just a robot. It can only say what is installed in the robot. It doesn't have the mind of its own. It doesn't have a will of its own. It doesn't have the, um, uh, the, the, it doesn't have the emotions of its own. Whatever this robot will do, you must install it. The same way you have a computer. Whatever is in the computer is what the technician installed in the computer. So you may even begin to ask computer questions. Tell me where is, um, how big is Cape Town? And the computer gives you the numbers. Okay, how large is Africa? It give you. So don't think the computer is thinking. It will only give you what is installed in there. Whatever is not installed in the computer or in the system, it won't be able to access that. So we say it. When we say the Holy Spirit is a person, or a personality, I said, number one, it should have what? I 
believe you have the notes. What must he have if he's a personality? Last of last week, last week I spoke a little bit on the fact that the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead since it was a resurrection Sunday. But a week before that, I began on this discussion. So let's go back to our notes. There are things that I told you, I even wrote it down on the, on the board to say, these are what makes a personality. Okay, so number one, you must have what? Knowledge, yes. So if we are going to arrive where we say the Holy Spirit is a personality, he must have knowledge of his own. He should know things. He should be able to know things. Number two, he must have his own will. And I even said, what makes you really, really human is this thing called will. You should never lose your will. It's even against the law. South African law, African law, United law, for anyone to lose his will. Are you with me? Any, anyway, if you force anyone to do things that they don't want to do, it's against the law. Their will should be exercised. When you come to your Bible, same principles. You don't make people do the things that you want them to do because of you have maybe advantage over them. It's against the law of God. People, humans, should exercise their will. Never override anyone's will. Okay, number three. He must have a mind. In other words, he should be able to think on his own. Because I'm saying that this artificial intelligence, they can create something that will be similar to a mind, but it won't, it won't be able to have its own reasoning. Whatever that will be there must be installed. Now, if he is going to be a personality, he should have a mind able to think on his own. So if what I'm saying is so, we should be able to go through the scriptures and find these things that are ascribed to the Holy Spirit. So he must have knowledge, we said, he must have the will, he must have the mind, what else? Emotions. Emotions. He must be able to feel things. Because if he, if he doesn't feel things, then we can, we, you know, some people believe he's a wind. The Holy Spirit is a wind. Now, if he's going to be a personality, ah, he should have emotion. So, the day I don't feel well, okay, I'm not happy, I'm not, things are not working well, I should know that he's, he has emotions. Okay, yeah, he, he, he should have emotions. <laughs> Can I tell you that there's a programming in you that teach your emotions how to react to certain things. There's a programming. So, a child, when he's young, he knows less about pain. The more he grow, the more, not that the pain becomes more, no, he, the, remember, the emotion, the pain is, the signal that gives you the, the knowledge of pain is your emotions. Okay, so if there's no emotions, you won't even know this is pain. The only time you know that it's painful, whether it's physically or emotionally pain, you feel your emotion that tells you this thing is painful. But a child uh, that is very young, their emotions is not able to tell them so many things as your emotions. So he must have his emotion. The day you are not okay, he should know today, even if you said nothing, the one is not okay. Why? He has emotion. And these are the attributes of a personality. He must have emotions. He must have emotions. Say it with me. He must have. Let's say it one more time. Okay. Now, the reason why I, I, I've just thought of saying that line again is because of the session we had last night. When we finished, I, 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 by the way, forgive my father. Let me tell you one thing that will happen. When we go to heaven, we will be neighbors. <laughs> you know that, I'm telling you the truth. So we must check each other in the neighborhood. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. When we go to heaven, God will make us neighbors. 
Okay, you know why very soon. So I, I, you know, I normally tell you that when I'm ministering, it's not the same me that after ministering. I don't know if that would be a better thing for you to hear, but I also believe that after I minister, I should also sit and hear the pastor. Okay, I I do that. I never preach. I, I've said this many times. No one can listen to Pastor Justin more than me. I don't even think it's possible that anyone can listen to Pastor Justin more than me. I don't think it's possible. I, I don't know what we'll be doing. So I listen to Pastor Justin more than anyone else. Because me too, I believe him. Believe me, I believe him. I, I believe him. So, so la- this morning I woke up to listen to him. Yeah, when it's quiet, everyone is sleeping. I woke up and I began to listen to him. So I was listening, then I, I noticed how he was explaining the first question. And I realized that he gave so much information that he would want it to go further than that small, narrow broadcast. And the reason why I ask you to repeat emotions is because of what I may want to add from what I said last night. How many of us were following us live? Quite a few of you. Okay. So. There came a question to me. Hmm, we may end up discussing this here, but it's relevant. I mean, it, it directed the course of what I would have said. And I, I said to myself, I would want to have questions like this because they are intelligent questions. And they are questions that when you answer them, you don't only answer the person that asked, you also answer the person that would think about it. And you also answer the person that did it and thought it was nothing. So it's not just a question that you answer and it's done. No, those are the questions when you answer it correct, you've answered many people. I think I would want to answer that question again. I would want to discuss a little bit. Okay, I would want to say something a bit on it. It touched me when I went to follow him at home and I realized what he was saying. <laughs> you need to understand that when we hold this microphone, you know, let me tell you, there are moments that I hold this mic sick. I only remember I was sick after preaching. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There are moments where I hold this microphone, I'm not well. I will do all my preaching, all my jumping. It is after we say amen, I go sit in the office that now I know I was sick. It's like now the sickness comes back. And this happens many times to me. I've never felt tired when I'm preaching. I've never feel exhausted. I may start that way, but the moment I start preaching, it goes. It will come back after preaching. So I, I know that there are so many things that happen when I minister. So even after I minister myself, I must also sit and listen what God was. Because uh-huh. don't think that we come, like for, for example, like last night's session, I mean, how could you prepare for all that? You can't, because you don't know what people will be asking. So that information is coming from somewhere. That is not your origin. So I had this question. I don't know if I'm able to. No, this is. This, I feel. I feel this is important. Question. I'm coming to the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. Okay. I think one of the media people can. I, do you have? No. Okay. I think they've got a question. They can help me. I feel like I would want to discuss it a bit. When there's a need, I know. Okay. Is anyone in the media able to assist us to have that question? It's a good question. Hallelujah. Believe me, it's a good question. So I answered, then I realized that there's one angle that I didn't talk about. But that angle normally, sometimes it comes as the doctor's advice. Because of what is happening, okay? Um, When the child is sitting on the wrong place, so they would ask you. So I thought, now it was when I was listening to pastor, then I said to myself, okay, pastor, but how about this condition? Understand me? Are we able? We can have it on the screen? No, just come and read it for us. Just come and read it. By the way, you look beautiful this morning. Uh-huh. Read it for us. I have been in a relationship for three years. I just found out that I am pregnant. And both of us are not happy and not ready for the pregnancy. We are both Christians and the man is a leader in our church. Because of the shame that this will bring on us and our families, 
my man is suggesting for abortion, but I'm scared, I'm, but I'm so scared of possible or future complications that might come our way. My man says that if I really love him, I should do it for him, and he promises to marry me, if, but if I don't, it, it will mean that I don't love him because this will destroy his reputation. This is not a small question. When I listened to the answer that Pastor was giving, I also asked Pastor another question. I said, but Pastor, how about those that it is the doctor that are suggesting? You know, you hear this thing, the baby sitting in a tube, so the baby may not really grow, so let's take the baby out. So I was asking Pastor. But by the way, he had the answer. You know how the answer came? Can I tell you the answer? When you kill someone, how do you call it? When you kill someone, how are you going to call it? When a policeman kills, how do you call it? Huh? 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 No, talk to me. I mean, I was also watching and then I begin to ask pastor questions. Say, what about the one that the doctor suggests? Because of this condition that is happening, let's remove the baby. Pastor, what do you say over this man? So now the answer came, okay, say, if you kill someone, you are going to jail. If the policeman kill a thief, huh? Huh? No, talk to me. Now, by the way, do you, okay, let's ask you, my brother, if you enter the army, why are you in the army? The end result of the army is what? Serving the nation. How? By giving them bread. <laughs> Talk to me. Because, I mean, I found it interesting when I began to ask myself many questions. And the answer came in this way. I don't know if I should be telling you this. You don't find a policeman arrested because they shoot a thief. You don't find that. Have you ever seen that before? They are trained. They will even let, let you know the gun I'm carrying is to use it, to use. It's not a toy. It's, the, it's not a toy. There is a time that um, the the police um, uh, leader one day made a statement because. The robbers were shooting and killing police and it became like a news over where at a certain period they were killing police everywhere. And then he now says, shoot to kill. You think he was arrested and he was encouraging people to kill? No, talk to me. If you, if you stand here, I am, like I, I say, go and kill. You think they won't arrest me? No, talk to me. They will arrest me. By encouraging people to commit a crime. But the, when the police leader is saying to the policemen, not to everyone, shoot to, don't, don't shoot to harm them. Okay, so, the same way, even in the Bible, you find an army that will go and fight and kill, and God doesn't call it man. Do you know that it was David who killed Goliath? And that killing was never recorded as he committed murder. But Moses, <laughs> so this one is justifiable because of the setting that is happening there. This other one is not justifiable. Now this would make this thing not to go where I want. Justifiable, not justifiable. But anyway, on another day, I would want to explain the fact that when a policeman kills, eh, he's not, he's not going to go to hell that he killed someone. Okay, it's like he was too shocked. When a policeman kills a thief, he's not going to go to hell that he killed someone. I should, maybe one day, I must come. I, okay, we'll keep this as a, as a question for next time. Do you know that even doctors sometimes they kill? Oh, you don't know. Okay.
okay, if you don't know, sometimes doctors will ask your family member to kill you. Say, he's just suffering. Switch off there. Let him what? So they switch off your oxygen. Who is killing you? Who is killing you? Huh? It's the doctor. They are afraid. They say, Yo, this your, your relative here has been suffering. I mean, he's not improving. Uh, get ready for the waste. Okay. They ca you come there, they're even waiting for you to switch off his oxygen. And then you switch off, then a few seconds you can see, tuk, 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 he's dead or killed. No, uh, who killed? Who is going to hell for that murder? You see what I'm trying to say? So I must come and explain it better. I, I did ask myself a question. I did. But don't worry. I asked and I had answered. Now, coming to the question that we had, the reason why I felt like this is a very detailed question and shouldn't be taken light is on the fact that these two people, they are saying they are both Christians. That's the first problem. We are both Christian. Number two, the lady doesn't think abortion is wrong. She's only concerned about future complications. It's not that pastor, uh, we are Christian, can we do it? No, we can do it according to her writing that question. The only thing that she's concerned is that there could be what? Future complications. And I felt it in my heart that this, this issue of abortion, I must explain it very well. So that next time, it won't be me meeting your friend. It will be you telling them what you've learned. Because most of these, your friends, before they do this thing, they'll let you know. And you won't just say no to them. You are going to explain why it is there. No. So I say it. Life begins at conception. The moment a woman conceives, life has begun. So it, you can't tell me that if you kill a three month life, is not killing. But if you kill a nine month process of life is now killing. Where do you measure life? Are you with me? Because I know by law you are encouraged to abort if you don't want the baby. I remember when my wife conceived our first daughter and I escorted her to the hospital for Antoinette. While we were sitting there, we saw small girls coming in and they went for the test and they found them pregnant and then the doctor is asking do you want to keep it in other words you have options this is not a child saying i want to take rid of, get rid of this no it's the doctor asking you are you are too young you want to keep it maybe let me go talk to my boyfriend okay let me not go far but here's the issue now I felt like I must, I must put an emphasis on what I believe is, 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 is truth. You say, life begins when a woman conceives. Are you with me? Are you with me? Now, if you abort a three weeks baby, you think it is nothing because the baby is only huh? three weeks. And then, if you want to abort a seven month baby, now think that that's the baby is big now is the baby no one week baby is still a baby pastor but it doesn't have legs yes it's still a baby it's still human the same way a baby is born is a man he has no beard but it will come so you don't it's not less human because of what is missing it's as full human as the one with beards are you serious the way you're looking at me you people I felt like this thing I must I must explain it very well. So when it comes to abortion, a Christian should not think of abortion. Because abortion is committing murder. Yes, it sounds good English to say what? Abortion. But it's still what? Killing. Because if you want to prove it, live that life, you will know there's a life. about to call James chapter 2 26 you know me with Bible <laughs> so James chapter 2 verse 26 the Bible says James 
chapter 2, verse 26. The Bible says, for a body without a spirit is dead. The fact that the baby is developing, there's a spirit. If there was no spirit, the baby would be dead. What in your stomach? So, while the baby is forming, the baby is growing, please, when you are going to hear this, be able to help someone there. It doesn't matter how many weeks the baby is. It's still a baby. You can even tell others, I have a baby. How old? Two weeks. It's still a baby. You don't say I've got something. No. You don't tell people I'm carrying something. You say I've got a baby. I've conceived. What have you conceived? This is three months. You are telling people you have conceived. I'm expecting. What are you expecting? So, if it happened that you went that route, you must go and confess. You didn't say amen. No, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor. Sin must be good. No, come. Sin must be good. Some of these things, if I don't even touch them, you may think they are right. That question for me, whoever sent and it, and it came as an anonymous. This was a good question. So, my husband, or this, my man, she even called my man, he's a leader. So, my sister, we're not discussing you. It's good that your question doesn't have the, your name. But your question was, was a good question because it can help others. Now, my man is a leader. If I keep the baby, this will bring shame on us. So, you want to protect your reputation and commit murder. To the point that the man said to her, if you love me, if you love me, I bought the baby. And I promise you, I will marry you. <laughs> okay, this is where now you come in. <laughs> it is here that you are coming in now. You remember what I was saying? Okay, good, you remember. <laughs> huh? If you are bought, I will marry you. And I will know that you love me. But if you don't abort, I will now know you don't care about my reputation. That is blackmailing. <laughs> that is, so I was saying blacklisting. And my old people there, they were looking at me like I'm, I'm speaking deeper English. <laughs> you know how I felt when I saw myself saying blacklisted. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so I told you now, that's why you come in. Because then I saw, you said, Pastor, is blackmailing. Then I thought you were speaking in tongues. <laughs> I continue. So now they encourage me, say, Pastor, blacklisting is still okay, meaning that they put you on the back of the list. <laughs> okay. But to make this issue short, th this church is full of the youth. And things like this must be well discussed. Marriage is for married people. Rather, sex is for married people. There's no, I mean, you, you can't get pregnant by mistake. It's not possible. No, it's not possible. If you do what brings pregnancy, pregnancy is coming. Is that a mistake? You know, we are picking things from society. We think they are biblical, they are correct. So, Pastor, it is a mistake. We didn't plan you. <coughs> Am I making myself clear? There is no, there is no baby by mistake. My brother, if you put your hand on the stove that is on, what will happen to you? You get burned by mistake. Because you knew that this is what stove. If I put my hand on it, I'll get. Now, if you get bent, don't come and tell us it was by. Don't tell us it was by mistake. You know what you were doing that you can get. Uh -huh. I hope I'm answering that question very well. It's not by mistake. You know that if I put my hand here, I can get bent. And when you got bent, don't say it was by mistake. So please, as a, as a Christian, abortion is sin. Not only sin, is murder because you are killing a life. You that killed two man's life, 
You are not less than the one that killed five year life. Life is life at all stages of life. There is no, this one now is a better life because he's more mature. No. So the one I will discuss next time is when the doctor suggests for an abortion. That one I will discuss it next time. Because just in case it does happen to someone, you say, no, my pastor says, doctor, leave this baby. That can compromise on the health of the mother. So as I teach, I must know where to draw the lines. Is that okay? I found it as an interesting question. So I only say this because of emotions. For a mother who can walk into a clinic to abort her own baby, something is wrong with her emotions. No, believe what I'm teaching you. A mother. A man may be out of this. Oh, just go and take that baby out. A mother. No. I have found mothers to be very emotional, emotional bound to their children. So when a mother feels happy, say, just give me money, I'm going to flush it out, flush it, it's not it. It's not it, it's a person. It's a person. So some of you youth, when you hear your friends finding themselves in this dilemma, please advise them to keep the baby. Because you might abort your own destiny helper. You might do that. And then struggle through life. That's because you killed your own help. How many of us here are the help to our parents? Now imagine if they aborted you. Who was going to help them? And if they aborted you with that good character and they kept the one that is giving them trouble. Because while you are aborting, you don't even know who you are killing. Could be the Joseph of the family you killed. So you have, the whole family is scattered because the one you killed was Joseph. Never think about that process. Never. Regardless of what happened, sin has already happened. Face the consequences. This is what is called maturity. You just keep the baby. Oh, there will be shame. Yeah, yeah, I'm not encouraging you, but I'm saying you won't be in shame forever. No, you won't be shame. I'm not encouraging anybody, but I'm trying to say if this happened, you are not you can't be shame for it. So don't say, Oh, because like that question, because of shame that will come upon us. No, you won't be shame for it. Keep the baby. You don't know who you'd want to kill. What if he's the Benin of Africa? What is it if he's the prophet of the nation? You know how many people will die sick because you aborted? Can you see that every person must be given a chance to live his life to the full potential without being interrupted by selfishness. So when your emotions are troubled and you lose the sense of feeling, nothing will tell you that what would happen if it was you in this case and your mother went and about you. Would you have life? The only reason why you have life because your mother kept you. If she was like you, I mean you are not going to be born. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I just thought of I must add a voice over that discussion. If I'm here, it's because my dad didn't say to my mom, let's take it out. He's coming, let him, let him come. So as soon as you conceive, remember I even said, as soon as you know, and I said not even know because you can know after four months you are pregnant. You can, some people, they can even after three, four, five months. But as soon as you conceive, life has begun. And anything that you do to that life, you'll be held accountable for that life. Anything. So I'm not here to condemn. I'm not here to judge. I'm not even expecting to have anyone that can have such a story. Yet. But if that happens, because where we are coming from, all of us have our stories. Okay. So this is not a message to judge, but rather to let you know that there is a fault that you must ask forgiveness for. Because you may think it's normal. You may even attempt to do it again. But when you know it is wrong, now you know this is not the door to judge. 
I have known people that have aborted and the time they became ready to have children and they couldn't conceive. So even heaven said, I mean, you, you've taken out enough. In, in, the, in, the, in, in heaven, you were supposed to have four children and you took out all your four. Now you are spending money everywhere to conceive. Nobody will give you that because you have killed all your womb. See, I, <laughs> you know, they said in, in, in heaven, you are going to have three children and you are aborted all three. Now the time you want to have them, they are not coming and you wonder why. So I'm trying to say, sometimes these are problems. But my sister, my brother, your, your pastor is not condemning you. He's saying that if this has happened, now you know it was a mistake. Because, I mean, we hardly hear these things in the church. You know why? You know, ask me. They make members start missing church. If you want to have a bigger church, everyone is happy, is giving well. Don't talk about sin. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, especially a church like our church where you have youth in the church. Pastor, leave sin. Talk about success. Talk about how to build a good status. Talk about how to have a better plan. But when you come and rebuke sin, they believe that you're going to make... Let me tell you, a person that really cares about you will tell you when you are in court. When he cares about you, he will tell you, this is called sin. Don't repeat no, don't worry, it's a mistake. It's called, no, it's not a mistake. It's called what? It's called sin. Because if it's a mistake, you won't even repent the right way. Because when you know it is sin, now you know it was sin. So when you repent, there will be remorse in your heart, knowing that actually I took a lot. Lord, I ask for forgiveness. And you, that forgiveness you're asking now is from the heart, because you know it is wrong. There are people who have passed this journey before that you are going to meet that they didn't know this was wrong. No, they didn't know because I mean the doctor they are advising you say if you are not ready take it out so did, did you feel good when you are before the doctor no it's like no more thing I have a choice you don't have a choice the choice you had is not to conceive you didn't say amen you don't have a choice if you must keep the baby or you must keep the baby the only choice you have is not to conceive the moment you conceive you don't have a choice on who is coming the same way you don't choose gender of which baby must be born. The same way you don't choose if this baby must be born or must die. The only choice you have is not to conceive. At, and you know what to do not to conceive. The moment you conceive, life has begun, you have no choice. The law may support you, but heaven will condemn you on it. So, if this has happened in the past, it's good we clear it with the Lord. Don't sit in a corner with a good conscience because God never brings truth to bound people. You didn't say amen. God never brings truth. God never brings truth to bind people. He brings truth to free people. Because now you know it was wrong. Now you can repent and you can clear your head knowing that now I'm forgiven. So, we arrived here by the emotions of the Holy Spirit. Today I will need someone to read for me. Ah, time is flying, but don't worry. I will be keeping my time. So we are going to start this journey, First Corinthians, chapter two, verse ten to twelve, and we read it um, last time. But I feel there is a need for me to start on this point and move forward. First Corinthians chapter 2. Okay. But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things. Now give us King James. I want us to, un to understand that the Holy Spirit knows things, He has knowledge. But God hath revealed them to us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deeper things of God. 11. For what, for what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? 
here it's saying which man knows the things of another man except the spirit of man which is in him oh i wish i wish i can explain to you meaning that whatever you know it is the spirit of man your spirit that is in you that knows okay now the things of god now huh let's go back to 7 verse 11 even so the things of god knoweth no man but the the things of god knoweth so the spirit of god has knowledge he knows the things of god remember i told you when we say god what do we mean son so they are all in one if it is not that way then we call one the father other one the son other one the holy spirit but so the things of god the spirit of god only the spirit of god knows them so this scripture is very typical for you because you will hear people that claim to know the things of god the bible say the things of god knoweth what no man no man knows the things of god except the spirit of god so the spirit of god here knowledge is ascribed to him he has knowledge he knows things your computer doesn't know things you are the one that knows things and you store it in the computer but he knows things hallelujah so the holy spirit is not a being that doesn't have knowledge he has knowledge of his own he knows things the same way he knows your name he knows your troubles he knows what you have been through give us uh, 12. now we have received not the spirit of the of the world but the spirit which is of god now listen that we might know the things that are freely given to us of god so now this is where most people are dwelling that the holy ghost may we have received the spirit not of man but from of god so that we might know so the things that we know we know them because we have received the holy spirit if it's not in you, you can't know the things of God. Because the Bible already tells you that the things of God, no man can know them. So what you think you know, it is the Holy Ghost in you that make you know. This is why it is waste of time, waste of energy to argue with a man who doesn't have the Holy Ghost about the Bible. No man knows the things of God except the Holy Ghost. You know, sometimes you find yourself in a tight corner. Someone is arguing with you about the Bible. The person is not even born again. You are wasting time. The Bible says what? No man knows the things of God. So that man cannot know the things of God except he has the Holy Ghost. What you know about God is because now you have the Holy Ghost. And that Holy Ghost is not a knowledge. The Bible says himself knows the things. And then 12 said, he revealed them to you. He revealed them to you so that you should know the things oh, that are freely given to us of God. God has given us certain things for free. For free. This one will not be out of your fasting. It won't be out of your giving. It's not out of your righteousness. These are what? Free. But only the Holy Ghost can reveal them to you. When you go on verse 9, the Bible says, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor have they entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. So there are things that your pastor doesn't know about you. Oh, put that verse back. There are things that your prophet doesn't know about you. The Bible says what? Eight. But as it is written, yes, that's the side verse. But as it is written, I has not seen, no, he I hate. Neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared. Watch it as prepared for those who come to church always observe these things they are things that god will do only for those that love him 
This thing of all of us will be blessed. It's a good encouragement. It's a good one, but may not be biblically correct. So there are things that God has prepared in your Bible says for those that love. The same way Romans 8:28, the Bible says, For we know that all things work together for the good of them, them that love the Lord. Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit has knowledge. If there is a need for you to know things, find rest by asking the Holy Spirit. He has knowledge. Tell me about what to do next. Tell me what I'm doing wrong, why this is not working. Ask because he has knowledge. And the Bible says he searches the deeper things of God. So say after me, the Holy Spirit has knowledge. So, a being that has knowledge is a personality. If he has knowledge, then he is a personality. If he doesn't have knowledge, then we are going to doubt if he is a personality. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11. But all this worketh that one and the same, the same spirit dividing to every man. Give me an IV. So we should find that he has what? A will. He has a will. The gifts that you have. Ah. Uh, New King James. Whatever you are going to receive, the gift that you are going to have, he wills who to give what gift. He wills. He determines who is going to. Okay. But one and the same spirit works all things, works all these things, distributing to each one individual as he wills. As he wills. As he, so the Holy Spirit has a will. He gives gifts to men as he wills. So he has a will. He can make a decision. He can decide things. He has a will. He's not a, a movement. He's not a power. He's a person because he has knowledge. He knows things. He has a will. He can make a decision. I'm going to give you a prophetic gift. He can decide. I'm going to give you a healing, a healing grace. He can decide. I'm going to give you a word of knowledge. He can decide. I'm going to give you a word of encouragement. He can give you gift as he wills. So he has will. So any being, any personality that wills is a person. Hallelujah. He wills. And if he can will, he's a person. Romans 8.27 King James So, so far we have discovered he has knowledge He has a will Now let's go to the mind Romans 28, 20, sorry, Romans 8.27 Now now he who searches the heart knows the mind. Talk to me. Knows the mind. Knows the mind. Knows the mind. So the spirit has a mind. The mind of the spirit. He has the mind. He can think. He can think on his own accord. He can think. He has a mind. The Holy Spirit has a mind. He's not an influence. He's a person. He has a mind. He can think. He has knowledge. He knows things. He has a will. He can make decisions. So he has a mind. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit has a mind. He can make decisions. He can plan. When the Bible says the Lord has planned our lives, Jeremiah said, I know the plans I have for you. If you are able to plan, you should have a mind. So he has a If the Holy Spirit is a person 
you should be able to love. And love is a what? Love is a what? An emotion. So we must found love ascribed to the Holy Spirit. If he is a person. So far we have found that he has knowledge. He has a will. We have found about the mind of the Spirit. Now we want to find if he has emotion. Can he feel? Can he love? Romans 25, Romans 15, 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and, <laughs> and what? And through what? And through what? And through what? So you, you didn't even know that the Holy Spirit has love. You only know that the Father has love because the Father loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus loved us. He died for us. Let me tell you, the love of the Spirit must be studied very well. He's the one that demonstrates his love more than the other God. I'll tell you why. Look, the Father showed his love. He gave us the son. The son showed his love. He came, lived for three and a half years and what? Died for us. But the love of the spirit. Imagine the fact that we are going to study when he's in you, he doesn't leave you. The Bible says you can grieve him. Imagine when you are in sin, how you betray his love for you. Imagine when you are constantly walking in sin, how you betray his love. Because he does betray you. He loves you enough to live in you. Hoping that you will understand that while I live in you, I have a standard and a status to maintain. While we walk in error, he's grieved. Why? His love is betrayed. So there is love. The Holy Spirit has love. And the love of the Spirit. He has love. It's not a thing. He has love. The reason why, you know one day David was praying. He said, take not your spirit away from me. Take not your Holy Ghost away from me. David is praying. You know why the Holy Ghost, you can't even pray that prayer? Because he came in love. So what makes him abide in the life of a believer who is not repenting from his error is love. David knew that this Holy Ghost is called Holy Ghost as a status. If I walk with him in error, he can depart. So he prayed, cast me not away from your presence. And do not take what? So he knew God can take his Holy Spirit away from me. But for a believer, God can't take the Holy Ghost away from you. Why? Because the Holy Ghost has love for you. What keeps him in your life is love for you. Love that you become right. One thing about the Holy Ghost, he never give up on us. Hallelujah. He never give up on us. He just believe you will get right. Justin, you will get right. I will hunt you down until you become right. Family can give up. Mother can give up. Pastor can give up. But the Holy Spirit, his love cannot give up. So you must understand that he is a being. He has love. He can demonstrate love. And love is an emotion. So we take time to worship the Father for his love, which he bestowed upon us and give us the Son. We worship the Son for living his state, living his glory, to come down in the world of sin and die for us. But do we remember to worship the Holy Spirit for his love? That he also left his state and took a boat in the heart of a sinful man like me. Yet every day trying to shepherd me to walk like I should walk. Why is he not abandoning me? Love. It's not that I'm in you just because I should be in you. I'm in you because I love you. And that's how he says. I'm in you because I love you. You are not too good, not too holy, not too powerful. But I'm in you because of love. And his love restricts him from leaving you. He stays in the life of a believer. Regardless of the condition, regardless of the mistakes, remember why we have the Holy Ghost is because of love. 
You should know. I have been in so many errors. Why didn't I lose him? Love. Pastor, I have done so many mistakes. But I should pray in tongues. You know some people say, they found out that this pastor was living in sin. Are you with me? And then the people are now shocked. They, but we still see miracles. We saw miracles. We saw him prophesying. Oh yes, the love. The love of the Spirit. That he can't give up on us. Because he has hope he will change. But the issue is that don't betray his love. If he is a person and he has emotion, or we are going to go further, you can hate him. Hallelujah. So far, we now see that there is what we call the love of the spirit. The mind of the spirit. He has a mind. He has love. He can demonstrate his love. He can demonstrate his love. Just think of how sweet his love is. The reason why you are able to pray is not because you are prayerful. Because of his love. Because if he abandon you, you'll be dry. You won't fall upon the name of the Lord. So even after weeks of not praying, somehow you find your grace again back in his feet. Why? The love of the spirit that never give up. I said to someone, and I'm saying to somebody here, it doesn't matter how your past look like. The love of the spirit never fails. This is why a child of God must never feel condemned because of yesterday. The love of the spirit. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, the Bible says, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There is no condemnation. Why they not condemn? The love of the spirit. The love of the spirit. Tell your neighbor, he loves you. Say it again, he loves you. Love him back. Tell them again, he loves you. Love him back. He loves you. He loves people that don't care about him. He loves people that don't even have time to talk to him. He loves people that ignore him, but he still loves them. That's how deep the love of the Spirit is. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8. Verse 30 media. Verse 30. 3 zero. Are we learning something so far? And what? And what? And what? What is grief? I told you that my teacher was not a qualified teacher. Nepotism made her a teacher. The uncle was the principal. So the sister said, my, This is my daughter. He's just sitting at home. <laughs> Can't you get something for us to do? He said, Don't worry. There are these kids that she can come and look after. <laughs> and while looking after her, she became a teacher. <laughs> so some of these things, we don't really know them, so he must be helping me. So what is grief? To, to grieve is to sorrow. To grieve is to hate. To grieve is to harm. Shall I say that again? To grieve is to sorrow. To grieve is to hate. To grieve is to harm. Now, I want you to look at that verse again. Knowing what I've just told you, that the love of the Spirit it is, is why even God cannot abandon you. Remember, I told you that the Holy Ghost is a guarantee, is a deposit guarantee in you. God has sealed you with the Holy Ghost. So, the moment... The moment God looked at you, he sees, seal, seal there. So he said, no, the seal, we can't lose our, 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 our person, our, our, our member. 
there's still hope because we have sealed this person with the Holy Ghost. Now, this is like a pleading. This is like a what? A pleading. You say, oh, don't what? Get him. Don't what? Get work with me. Don't what? Don't hurt him. Don't grieve him. Yes, he can be grieved. So the Holy Ghost can be in a believer and he's not happy. He's grieved. Why? The things that we do. The things that we do. So the Bible says, do not grieve him. So sometimes you want to walk in error. Remember, you are going to grieve the Holy Spirit. Oh, put that verse again. It's a pleading. Do not grieve him. It's not an advice. It's a what? A pleading. Do not grieve him. Put King James. He said, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Grieve not. Don't do it. Hallelujah. Don't do it. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. A believer should be walking with the Holy Ghost consciousness, knowing that even though I walk alone, I'm never, never alone. I've got escort. Someone is walking with me. Ah, and grieve not. Grieve not. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Whereby he are what? Sealed unto the day of redemption. So God has put the Holy Ghost in you to preserve you for redemption. And all he's asking you that don't grieve him. Yes, we know you will not live because of his love. But don't let me not live in grief because of how you live. Oh, um, I pray that the Holy Ghost will be happy in your life. I pray that the Holy Ghost will be happy, not with your life, in your life. So, can you grieve a power? Talk to me, church. Can you grieve a power? Can you grieve an influence? No. If someone can be grieved, can be sorrowed, he should be a person. He should be a person. Say, so don't hurt him. You can't hurt a power. You can't hurt an influence. If they say, don't hurt him, that means he's a person. Don't do it. Don't put a knife of sorrow to his throat. And then he's walking with you while he's bleeding out. And he can't backslide from you. Rather, he can't let you go. He can't uh, retract himself from you just because of his deposit, his love for you. But while he's loving you, remember to love him back. Love is good love when you are loved back. Love is what? Good love when you are loved back. Even with the Holy Ghost. Love is good love. When you, are, when you love and you are ignored, that's bad love. It becomes good love when you are loved back. So the Bible said, do not hate him. Hallelujah. Say after me, I will never hate the Holy Spirit of God. And they even let you know that this is the Holy Spirit of... They let you know the origin. So it can be grieved. To grieve also to, is to afflict. Meaning he can be afflicted by the things we do. And the Bible plead with us, do not what? Afflict him. It's a pleading, do not afflict him. He came because of love. He came to preserve you for redemption, but do not grieve him. Do not afflict him. Do not sorrow him. Some of us must now realize and make a decision. Oh, there's a statement Job made. I can't just quote the verse now. He said, I made a vow with my eyes. What a statement the man would make. I made a vow with my eyes. Ooh. I made a vow with my eyes. That there are certain things I will never look at in my life. He said, I made a vow. I promised my eyes. There are certain things I will never allow you to see. This is a man talking to his eyes and promises as I'm promising you. <laughs> this, these are men who are determined to please God. They are determined. It's not by chance. They are what? Determined. 
I made a vow with my eyes. I will look not on a damsel, he said. I will look not on a damsel. I made a vow with my eyes. Ah, what, a, what a statement a man would make. Ah, I have made a covenant. Hey. I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? I have made a covenant. I'm not trying to be careful. No. I sat down with my eyes. I said, this my eyes will not look upon. Hmm. Ah. In your Bible, you find this kind of man. Say, I made a vow. This is a vow. It's a covenant with my eyes. In this way, we will not walk. Let's agree. Let's cut a covenant with your eyes. So then you know that there are places you don't go because they expose your eyes to things you do not see. There are groups you don't join because they ex expose your eyes to things you should not see. Men, that statement, put again, let's say encourage some men. That statement is for you. It's coming from another man. I have made a what? A covenant. Let me see King James. A covenant. I've made a vow. I've made a covenant. Imagine, not with anything, with my, my eyes. So in other words, this man sat down with his eyes. I don't know how, but he did. My eyes. Who is he talking to? Ah, the Bible, he said he did what? He did what? He made a covenant. So he said to his eyes, eyes. Let's agree. Since now I'm married, he's talking to what? Since I am married, I will not put my eyes on a young woman. King James Coa, a damsel. Huh? Color flashing, body shape. Uh -huh. I will not put my eyes on a woman. Promise? His eyes say, promise. The man is walking. So this man now is careful where he's gonna turn. Because there is a what? There's a covenant. So it's not those men that walk like this. No, <laughs> he controls it where is are you still here? He controls what he's looking at because he made a covenant with his eyes. So there are things that make other men turn, can also make him turn. But he chose not to because he has made covenant with his eyes. So don't think we don't see what others see. No, don't think that way. But we have made, you said to yourself, this I will not do. Let me tell you, I found it to be powerful when you begin to promise yourself. I will not drag myself to this level. This I will not do. This I cannot be found in. It helps you. So we found a man who made covenant with what? His eyes. I wish you could have a man say, man. By the way, I, I have a project for all the men in the church. We love to meet. Not to discuss you how to keep your eyes No. <laughs> it's something else. But it could be nice to have men who, who have a covenant with their because eyes are men's problems. And I won't touch that. Because I know some of you are waiting to hear a comment. <laughs> a man who can control his eyes can do more. Even, even women know that the weakness of a man is his eyes. So brothers, you are hearing. So they look like they don't like you. They don't want you. They know that. <laughs> ah, let me leave this thing. I'm a pastor. I see a lot. I experience also a lot. Yeah, just so you know. So my brother, they look like they don't look at, at you. They, they, they are trying to give that cold shoulder, but they know the areas to put before you. You are not in the spirit. They look like they're not, they're not in your face. They look like they don't care about you. But I'm saying, but there are no areas to put before you. Because they know that your weakness is your. So another 
that man knew my weakness is my eyes. So he went in the bedroom and made a covenant. <laughs> and he said to his eyes, we will not. Oh, you don't believe that the weakness of the man is his eyes. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say concerning men in his eyes? He said, if you look on there, if you look, so even Jesus knew that the problem of men is looking. <laughs> ah, I, I, I reserve you. He said, if you look on the woman and you last after, you have committed adultery in your heart. If you what? So if you avoid looking, you are better, you are, you are, you are better. Whoever looks at her, look at a woman to last for her. He has already. So this is now Jesus, not Job. He's also saying the problem is what? Look. Looking. So if you are a man, you want God to help you. Let him help you with your eyes. Hallelujah. The way these men are looking at me, they know I'm saying the truth. Let God help you with what? So there are things that pass you and you don't tell. Hallelujah. Huh? There are things that would pass you and you choose not to turn. I have made a covenant with my eyes. I'm not turning. I'm not checking it out. What I saw and was passing is enough. Whoever should hear there this thing? <laughs> so it's a covenant we must make. Eh? This is for men. These sisters, they'll slay you all. They'll slay you. But not in seat of rest. Somewhere else. This is why women that are married mustn't think that married killed the man's eyes. I'm putting a good balance here. Eh? Women that are married mustn't think like the fact that the man is now married, his eyes are dimmed. He can no longer see. No. It's you see. See, this man said, I will not put my eyes on a young woman. Simply mean, we are growing older with my wife. But I will not tend to young women. That's what he's saying. So, even married women must look beautiful for their husband. Because men love beautiful things. Don't worry. If you don't say amen, you are still going to go home and practice. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's true. It's true. Because now that, now that he has married you, my, my brother, wrap her every day. When you come home, and welcome home, the rapper is here. Where you are coming from, you are making your eyes not to be dancing because you are... <clears throat> so when a man comes home, he must find a better version. Ah. <laughs> I know that I teach good. I know. Pastor Justin, you teach very good, sir. Okay, so I'm going to stop here because of time. Next week, I'll add a little bit properties, characteristics that are ascribed to the Holy Spirit that make him a person. So we are going to talk to him in a few minutes. Now we know is not an influence. Now we know it's not a it's not a power. It's a person. Meaning we can talk. And I've already helped you to say when he's talking back to you, this is how he speaks. You can talk to the Holy Spirit thought to thought. But just make sure that when you are thinking, you are directing those thoughts to him. Have you ever in a place, have you ever been in a place, uh, maybe, let me put this for example. I've, uh, this has happened to me. Whether, let's say you're on the queue. Hmm? And there's a, a trailer that you want to end up. Okay. You, you are now saying to yourself, no, 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 no. No, I don't want that one. So, in your mind, you are even calculating, say, take longer. Because there's only one person before me. Don't finish. But you didn't say anything. So that thought is a, it's a voice, you are talking. So the same way you talk to the Holy Spirit. You didn't say anything, but you are thinking in a direction of 
what you want to say to him. So I want you to have that relationship where you can be with people while you are talking to him. People can begin to talk to you and you are asking him, is this thing true? While they are talking, you are also talking. Say, Lord, what they are telling me is what? Is it true? And suddenly you just felt some funny way and you know you are spoken. Say, my brother, I don't think this thing is true. Let me have time to verify it. Why? Because you also asked. And then the more you talk to him, the more you know about him and the more you will know how he speaks. My wife has more chances of knowing me more than my mother. Why? I've lived with her more than some of you got married when you are 20. Now you are 45. Simply mean that your spouse has lived with you longer than your mother. So your spouse will end up knowing more about you than your mother while you have spent more time together. The same with the Holy Spirit. When you begin to spend more time with him, you will know more about him. You even begin to know his emotions, since he has emotions. See, when you begin to put this in mind of his location, there are certain emotions that you feel that you know you are not feeling it, he's feeling it. The same way we come here and look like super being when we say, who has a back pain? Your pain is here and someone is walking out. Because we knew that what we are feeling is not us feeling. He is the one feeling it and telling. So now we know that this feeling is not me. It's a prophecy. You see that now. Why? We have spent time together. So I can be in a service. I feel pain on my uh, right shoulder and I know that this is not my pain. So then I ask, who has a pain on the right shoulder? Because he's talking to me. So I may say the Lord is saying, but as a pastor, I always help you how he says it. I'll say, who has stomach pain? Who is struggling to sleep? You don't know what happens to my body for me to pick those signals. But the more time you spend with him, I'm telling you, people come, there are people who lie to me, but they lie to themselves. Yeah, I'll be asking nothing like this. Because he's telling me that they're lying. No, I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the, the holy truth. They'll see that they are lying to me. I'm looking at them. I even have got a smile. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I see. I see. Oh, wow. Mm, I see. But I don't have any desire to put correction. But if the desire comes, I'll tell you that, no, my sister, I think this is not true. So I'm not saying this because I'm a pastor. I'm saying this because I'm a believer. The same way you are a believer. There are certain things that we are, we are about to do in our lives. Maybe say, to cut a business deal. Maybe to take up a job offer. Try to talk to him. Is this your will? Should I do it? What do you think? What are you saying? He has the way of communicating. You may not hear an audible voice. But when he speaks, he is a master communicator. He is a master communicator. Hallelujah. Can you talk to him now? Show me and teach me your ways. Show me and what? Teach me your ways. Teach me your ways. You know a mature believer, huh? a mature believer, when you shake hands, he doesn't just shake your hand. He's also assessing you. If you know me, I don't like people greet like, like, like this. If you, huh? There are people I told them, greet me, greet me right. Have you ever had those people? I also do like this also. So that's not a greeting. <laughs> we must, hmm, my brother. Huh? Huh. But when you become spiritual, when you shake hands, you also assess the person. You can know that the person has a problem without knowing what problem it is. But by shaking hands, the Holy Ghost in you has filled, fill him, and he will begin to sense certain things. I'll give you a homework that you must go and observe. My brother, come. This is the homework. Since I'm teaching about the Holy Ghost. Now, let's say I want to prophesy. And I'm saying homework to go in. When I struggle to peek into you as a prophet, what I should do is to begin to tap you. My brother, what's your name? So go and watch prophets. Why am I tapping him so the Holy Ghost can pick the signal? Go and go and observe. Go and ob I'm not saying go and observe. You see what I'm telling you. So the same way when you shake, shake hands, you can pick someone's condition as a believer. And know that even though it looks okay, there's a trouble. 
So all you need is to be sensitive to know that while you are shocking, shaking in, he must say something about it. So you see prophet walking around, trying to pick signals, okay? They'll come again. They can, huh? They can even greet you. Go and watch them. All this, they know that this is how we get information. So when you see us walking up and down, we are asking, if nothing is coming, we come and say, my brother, what is your name again? Savior, okay, Savior. All this, I'm trying to tap into him. So when you know the Holy Ghost, you begin to look at things. Oh, so this is why they are doing these things, because now you know him. So there are people at work that you will shake hands now, not like before. In your heart, Lord, is there anything to encourage this sister? Is there anything you want to say to her? You just shake hands and say, my sister, psh, you know that God loves you. That voice, you hear say, oh, pastor, I wanted to hear things like this. Have you ever tried that before? So exercise this thing. I want to know your ways. The Holy Ghost is not for pastors. It's not only in pastors. Pastors, they've just spent time to hear him and to learn his ways. But this is not for pastors. Everyone should know him. Some of you are in school with friends who are abused. You even eat lunch together, but you can't sense. No, you should be able to sense. Oh, I wish I can explain this. You should be able to sense. Say, my friend, your face looks okay. You look happy. But I don't know why I feel like there's something you're not telling me. Have you ever heard such a statement before? I'm not, hallelujah. Have you ever heard such a statement before? Say, I think there's something you are not telling me. That's the same thing I'm saying, where you are able to sense. You are saying everything, but there's something that you are not able, you are not telling me. Now, what is giving that signal is the Holy Ghost. That whatever you are hearing is not complete. You now say to them, open up, there's something you're not telling me. Ah, okay, okay, I'll just say everything now. Uh -huh. But this is how you must walk as a child of God. When you walk into environment, you should know you are an agent of change. God will all, listen, God will always want to touch someone through you. I'll say it again. God will always want to touch someone through you. So when you come to new people, always remember there's something that God would want to say to them that you should say to them. So my brother, take a seat. Are you willing to have a few minutes with him? Show me your ways. Show me your ways. If I visit a house that practice muti, I don't need to prophesy. I know how my body feels. If I meet people who wear something, I don't need to see, say I'm seeing a black and white bead. No. I know how my body feels. Because it's a language. When we go into the, the language of the Holy Ghost, we now realize that there are so many languages that he can use. All we need to do is to keep on following him. I want to know your ways. You have three job offers. You may not open the Bible, my sister, and find the verse that says this is your job. Are you with me? There are three jobs. You went and applied. They call you three interviews. All of them, they're giving you offers. How would you know which one is of the Lord? Oh, there are three offers. They said yes, 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 yes. And they all look good. But which one would you know, my sister, you must pick? Because you're not going to open Isaiah and say, oh, you must pick the second job. This is for those who say everything is in the Bible. Tell your neighbor, I'm a walking Bible. No, tell them again. The Bible calls us epistles. We are written epistles. So there are things that you're not going to open the Bible and read. I'm giving a good example. Job offers, three job offers. You want to pick one. There is no Bible verse that says this is the job. So there should be a way God can lead you to pick the job, the right job. Now, this is where the Holy Ghost comes in. You may end up picking a job with less offer, but that's the one you feel like this is it. Why? That's the language he's talking. People say, but you, you, this, this is the one with good offer. The Holy Ghost has seen that you'll be there for two months and they'll let you go. 
but here you are going to grow. And in two months, you're going to arrive here. So, until we begin to have this mind that I have got help in me, remember the Bible called him the helper is in you. So, you begin to ask him, Must I do it? Must I not? Must I take this offer? Must I not? My brother, if you don't ask, he doesn't talk. He talks better when you what? Ask. Lord, I'm a bit confused. The, both offers look okay, and you are serious. And I told you, talk to him like you talk to a person. Lord, I'm a bit confused. Both offers look okay to me. I don't know which one I must take. Please help me, or please lead me. He will. He will. How will you know he's leading you? You will know by the job you pick. You know, when I read this in my Bible, I told you, oh, it was yesterday, that Peter said to Jesus, you are Christ, the son of the living God, and he didn't know that what he was saying, it wasn't his knowledge. You will know by the job you will pick after saying that. That's the one he led you to. And you find out that the one you pick was the right job for you. Why we end up in wrong places? We don't consult. Hallelujah. We don't consult. It doesn't take time to talk to him. A child is sick. Before you start running everywhere, talk to him. I've learned this by experience. That these are our children. We mustn't just go and lay them in the hands of anyone because they are wearing a uniform. When you pray, he's going to control even who should receive your child at the hospital. Maybe there's a bad nurse who is learning. You make them have an emergency to visit the toilet. That's when you arrive in. So, oh. hmm. But why these things happen? We don't talk to him. We believe that if we talk to him, he won't talk back to us. Let's rise up on our feet. Show me your ways. Show me your ways. Show me what? Your ways. We should become a mature church. Mature believers that always try to discern things. Someone is talking to you. You ask yourself, Holy Spirit, is this all they should tell me or they are reserving something? While you are looking at them, you just begin to say to them, my sister, this your story is not complete. Is him speaking? Is him speaking? You didn't hear him say that to you, but he's speaking through you. I'll give you verses that the Bible speak of David spoke by the Holy Ghost. So it wasn't the Holy Ghost speaking through him, it was him speaking by the Holy Spirit. Can you talk to him? Show me your ways, lead me in your ways. A few minutes, let's talk to him. Let's talk to him. Oh, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, oh, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, show me your ways, teach me your ways. When I go to work tomorrow morning, show me the right things to do. Show me the right things to do. Those in business, show me the right customers. Show me the right friends. Show me the right friends. Show me places to avoid. Sometimes you end up in the wrong place just because he's not leading you. Show me places to avoid. Show me friends that are not good for my destiny. Parents, you can extend it. Pray for your children. Lead them, Holy Ghost. Lead them. When they go to school, make them understand what they are learning. Help them. The Bible call him the helper. Help my children.
Please talk to him. Talk to him. Talk to him. If you have to repent of past mistakes, do that to him now. Talk to him. Matela Kaurus Kela Valias. My shortcomings, Lord, forgive me. I keep on walking in the wrong things, doing the wrong things. I repent. Help me to be right. Help me to be right and help me to know the way. Help me to make good choices in life. Help me to make quality decisions. Help me. The Bible calls him your helper. Do not ignore him. He's your helper. Help me have a good home. Help me to have a good marriage. Help me to have a good Because we have ignored you for long, but we repent. We say, henceforth, we ask you to help us. We ask you to lead us. Direct our path. Let our lives show that we've got help. Let our lives show that we've got a helper who is above all men. As we wake up tomorrow morning for our daily activities, we ask you to breathe on it the breath of life. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. And let's put our hands together for Jesus. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want you to go home knowing that the Holy Spirit is a person. Do not ignore him. You will know more about him when you begin to have conversation with, with him.